Thank you, folks. There is so much to discuss here, and we're really excited to have um, many of the people involved with the making of this film here tonight. Um, I'd like to introduce the executive director of Just Vision, um, Suhad Baba. Please also welcome the director of the film and uh, director of creative, uh, the creative director of Just Vision, um, Julia Basha. Yeah, thank you. One of the producers of the film and a good friend of other Israel's, Daniel Shalfin. Daniel. And this man needs no introduction because you'll know him well from the film, um, Brian House, the staff attorney at ACLU. And to moderate the conversation, please welcome Rabbi Margot Hughes Robinson from True Eye. Good evening. Thank you so much, Isaac. Oh, thank you all so much for being here. That was incredible. Going one more round of applause for this incredible film. <laughs> Amazing. So how uh, the next several uh, minutes are going to run is that we'll start with a bit of an internal conversation. Again, thank you all so much for being here. I will uh, run down our impressive panel, give folks a little more insight into who we have the privilege of speaking with tonight. Um, and after we ask a couple of internal questions, we will move again um, to more of a group conversation. I um, also want to remind folks and really invite you, um, I know there's many, many people in this room and no doubt also folks who are engaging with us online um, who are deeply committed to this kind of work and have a deep background. Um, and I will politely ask as we move, uh, Julie and I were discussing this <laughs> before while we were planning the, planning the panel a bit, that we take our time here to ask um, questions and do not be afraid to ask hard questions to really inform the conversation. We are so, so lucky that our partners, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, JFREG, have sponsored um, and are hosting a really lovely reception afterwards. So this is really a time for us to sharpen our understanding and ask better questions. Um, and we can do the fabulous introducing and schmoozing and getting to know each other and connecting around our work um, upstairs kind of post panel. So again, I'm Rabbi Margot Hughes Robinson. I'm the New York rabbinic organizer at Trua, the rabbinic call for human rights. We organize rabbis and cantors in North America and the occupied Palestinian territories, um, over several hundred rabbis in New York, some of whom are here tonight. <laughs> Um, so just to run down again, who we have with us in this room, Suhad Baba is a producer, news publisher, and executive director and president of Just Vision. Suhad produced Boycott and executive produced Naila and the Uprising, which premiered in 2017. She's also the co-publisher of the award-winning Hebrew language news site, Local Call. Julia Basha is a director of Boycott. She's a Peabody award-winning filmmaker and creative director of Just Vision. Her directing credits include Boudreaux from 2009, My Neighborhood from 2012, and Naila and the Uprising, as well as Boycott. Daniel Schalfen, who we have here, at Bo um, was one of our producers. He's a Peabody, DuPont, and Critics' Choice Award winning and multiple Emmy-nominated film and television producer and co-founder of Naked Edge Films. His recent films include Loudmouth, executive produced by John Legend, Captains of Zatari, I hope I said that right, for Hulu, and the Netflix original Pray Away. Um, and next to me, finally, we have Brian House, the senior staff attorney with the ACLU's Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. Since joining the ACLU in 2012, Sorry, I'm talking about you while you're sitting next to me. Brian has litigated cases defending free speech rights of labor unions, writers, journalists, activists, media organizations at all levels of the federal and state court systems. Thank you all again for your brilliant work and for being here tonight. So Julia, if I could put you on the spot with a very pointed question first, what drove you to, to make this film? Why did you decide to create Boycott? Thank you so much for joining as our moderator. Um, I've been working with the team at Just Vision for about 18 years now. And um, is this working? Yeah, you know, okay, great. Um, and about five years ago, uh, we realized that laws that started in Israel uh, targeting the ability of individuals to advocate uh, for a boycott of Israel for Palestinian human rights was were getting exported into countries in Europe and states and attempts at the federal level in the United States. 
And while these bills were being passed in America, there was very little conversation about them. Uh, almost zero public debate, public scrutiny. Till this day, the vast majority of Americans have no idea that these laws are in the books and might appear in their contracts. And so we felt that it was really important to tell the story. And when we learned that there was a first plaintiff emerging in Kansas who didn't end up in the film, sadly. Um, her name was Esther Kuntz, and she was a math teacher. She was the first person to take her state to court. Uh, we felt that uh, there was a really compelling story. We made a bet that there would be more courageous Americans from different political backgrounds that would take this to court, and that that would make for a powerful way, a personal way, uh, to investigate how these bills had come to pass um, and look at um, the conversation, the legal debate that would emerge as these bills made their way through the courts. Thank you so much. And particularly um, talking about that legal debate, Brian, I wanted to ask you, and a little bit with some uh, professional interests, as Petrua and J Street and a number of other organizations have submitted, I think, an amicus brief. Um, I had kind of a familiar groan when we got to that part of Alan Leverett's case at the end of the film. Um, but could you give us an update at all to Alan Leverett's case or the other cases featured, sort of what's going on right now? Sure thing, and, and first I just wanna say thank you so much for having me here. It's a pleasure to speak with you all, and, and thank you so much as well for Trua's excellent amicus briefs in these cases. They've been a real huge help. Uh, so as you all saw at the end of the film, the state had asked the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals to rehear Allen's case, and, and the way federal appeals generally work, you start off in a trial court in front of just one judge. When you go up on appeal, there's a three-judge panel drawn at random from the federal appeals court in that region who hear the case, and that was the three-judge panel that Alan won in front of in the film. Uh, but sometimes, every once in a long while, the entire court for that region, the Eighth Circuit in this case has 12 active judges, can decide to rehear the case on banc with all of those judges participating. And so the state in this case said that it represented an issue of extraordinary importance given the wide number of anti-boycott laws that have now proliferated across the United States. It said the Eighth Circuit needed to rehear this case on Bonk and the Eighth Circuit agreed. Uh, unfortunately, after the Eighth Circuit heard the case, um, they issued a complete abdication of the panel's ruling. Um, what they said was that Claiborne Hardware and the First Amendment protect the right to speak in support of a boycott or associate in support of a boycott but they said, and I quote here, uh, they do not protect the consumer transactions at the heart of the boycott itself, uh, which is the sort of distinction only a lawyer could love. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately what that meant, according to Eighth Circuit's decision, is that there was no, there is no protection, First Amendment protection for consumer boycotts. And that would mean that the state has the power even to single out a boycott on a specific issue, whether it's boycotts of Israel, or say the Montgomery bus boycott if we're back in the Jim Crow South, um, or boycotts of Nike or boycotts of fossil fuel companies, it can selectively target specific boycott campaigns that it disapproves of and say, we're gonna outlaw the actual participation in that boycott. And if you want a government job, if you want a government contract, they could even theoretically pass criminal law saying that you can't participate in these specific boycott campaigns. And according to the Eighth Circuit, the First Amendment would have nothing to say about it because the act of boycotting, according to the Eighth Circuit, is not expressive. And I just think that that decision is profoundly wrong. Um, it's profoundly wrong because first, it violates the Supreme Court precedent in NAACP versus Claiborne Hardware, which you all heard so much about in this film. Uh, there's one quote in particular I would draw your attention to where the court says, and again I quote, uh, the right of the states to regulate economic activity could not justify the complete suppression of a nonviolent, politically motivated boycott designed to achieve political, social, and economic change. That's exactly what the boycott campaigns at issue here are designed to do. Um, and here the state is claiming the power to completely suppress, suppress the boycotts if it wants to. And so we just think that that Eighth Circuit decision fundamentally conflicts not only with the Supreme Court decision, but with 250 years of American political practice, whether you're talking about the founding era boycotts of British goods, the abolitionist boycotts of slave-made goods from the Caribbean and from the American South, uh, anti-fascist boycotts in the lead up to World War II, obviously the Montgomery bus boycott and the civil rights movement boycotts, the boycott of apartheid South Africa, just a long American tradition of participating in these consumer boycotts as a sort of we the people expression of popular dissent. 
And so we think that that is the kind of issue that the Supreme Court needs to step in and take a look at. So about two weeks ago, we filed a petition for certiorari. It's a, it's a petition basically asking the Supreme Court to exercise its discretion and take up and hear this case. Uh, we expect to receive the state's response to that petition sometime in the next month or two. And I think early next year, we'll know whether the Supreme Court's going to step in um, and right the wrong that the Eighth Circuit has created here. Incredible. Thank you. And I appreciate the very detailed and thoughtful uh, for us lay people <laughs> right out of this. I think it really is, some of it is, you know, specificity that only a lawyer or a rabbi could love. And yet it's, it's really essential to all of our civil uh, First Amendment rights and rights to free speech. Um, kind of moving down the line here, Daniel, I wanted to ask you, um, so I know Boycott has screened not only here at the Other Israel Film Festival here at the JCC, but also at South by Southwest, at Tribeca, at a host of other places. Can you tell us um, where else Boycott has been and where else it is going? Where can we see it next? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for having us. Um, it's a very interesting moment in the film industry where um, people often buying films are looking for celebrities and true crime, but there's also a huge audience for these political films. And we've been really successful, fortunately, um, because we also have superheroes on screen here. Um, getting the film around the country, so to date it's screened in close to 90 cities, um, which includes across 21 states and across uh, eight countries. And it's coming to a lot more in the months to come. And uh, spread the word, hear it here first. From February, it's going to be available on Amazon and Google and iTunes and uh, broadly available across the country. So. Um, <laughs> Please, please let everybody know. Congratulations. I'm excited to get my family members to watch it with me again. <laughs> um, and Suhad, I wanted to ask you, so the end of the film um, really kind of helps us draw out and connect this to a wider legislative issue um, nationally, as Julia's referencing, even internationally, it sounds like, some countries in, in Europe and elsewhere, these cookie cutter bills that are spreading across the country, really targeting our ability also to boycott the fossil fuel industry or the arms industry. Can you update us on sort of where these laws stand now and what you hope the film is able to achieve through its impact campaign? Absolutely. Thank you, Margo, uh, for being with us. And thank you all again for being such committed, focused folks and spending your evening before Election Day with us to talk about this. Um, again, my name is Sahad Baba. And Julia and I and the team at Just Vision, including a few here, Sarah, as well as Jordana, um, we began following this story several years ago when the bills first were murmurings um, back in 2015. And we began following those bills, as Julia shared earlier, because we, they looked very familiar. We knew what they looked like in Israel. We started to see them take root um, in places like the US and in Europe. Um, and we were deeply, deeply concerned about what it meant for those who care about Palestinian rights and those who are dissenting with Israeli policy in their treatment of Palestinians and the human rights of Palestinians. We also were very concerned about what it would mean to adapt these laws, to apply them to any other issue area. When we first began following these stories, that was just a hypothetical. By the time we finished the film in 2021, new bills around firearms and fossil fuels as you get introduced to at the end of the film began to take root. The first laws in places like Texas, Oklahoma, Alaska, and North Dakota. More than that, those who are behind the anti-BDS laws um, are also behind these other laws. So the American Legislative Exchange Council, for example, and surprisingly, in December 2021, get together for their annual meeting. And at these annual meetings, they try to and attempt to align conservative legislators with the corporate um, sector. So it's a lot of business folks and a lot of conservative legislators in a room together. They decided to declare war on critical energy theory <laughs> at this meeting. And one of the key tools in their toolbox, they stated very plainly, would be the anti-boycott bills on fossil fuels. Since that meeting, several new states have introduced um, or passed anti-boycott laws on the fossil fuels industries, um, as well as the firearms industries. Today we're talking about at least two dozen more um, that are now, come 2023, we're paying attention to uh, elections Starting on January, states across this country are going to restart their legislative processes. So pay attention to what's happening in your backyard. Now, there's a reason that I want to just talk a moment about why these things are linked. Why is Palestine, fossil fuels, and firearms linked? So often, I think, 
we assume that when one issue area is being impacted or communities who are being impacted be by certain laws, it may not spread as quickly as it does. This is actually, Palestine is oftentimes made an exception. So on Palestine, we oftentimes think about this as not impacting what's happening in our backyards. With these bills, we actually see that what is happening in Palestine is happening in our backyards. The reason that these bills were able to pass in the first place was because state legislators paid no attention to what these laws actually meant in practice. And you see it with people like Senator Bart Hester, who said, look, all of my comrades, my colleagues, on the left and the right of me, we all voted yes for this bill. You meet Greg Letting in the film, who said, it was of no consequence to me, of course I'm gonna vote yes with this, right? Um, and now you're seeing those very same democratic legislators like Greg Letting on their back foot because people who care about the environment, people who care about gun safety, now are not being able to organize and activate by saying, look, I'm gonna use my purchasing power here to not invest in fossil fuels companies, to not invest in weapons and arms industries. And so I think the lesson in this for us is really that you can't make an exception out of any issue area, that we all have to be organizing and working together in tandem about the safety, the rights, the dignity of all communities. And I think the last thing that I just wanna share because we were talking about the distribution of this film, why does it matter? At Just Vision, we've always believed in the power of people and the power of organizing. And I think Brian says it beautifully in the film when he says there's no court, no Congress, no president that will protect our rights necessarily. It ultimately is in the hands of the people. We want this story, this film, to be in everyone's backyards. We wanna make sure people know about these laws, can organize around these laws, and can start asking some of the deeper questions about what is happening in our political system today that allows for something like this to happen unchecked and unnoticed for this long. We do have the power to create change in this moment. This is a story that is unfolding, um, and we hope that if you're interested in organizing with us, you reach out to our team at Just Vision. Um, you can check us out, sign up for our email list at www.justvision.org, or um, email uh, info at justvision.org um, to set up a screening. Thank you so much, Sahad. Um, and before we, we open it up, I think there's uh, folks circling the room with a microphone, but I just do wanna wish all of you a yasher koach. May you be strengthened, may we be strengthened through your work, we're so grateful for it. We're gonna now begin a wider conversation. Um, we've got we got some hands and we got a mic. Hi, to um, your last point, I just, I'm curious, this, if you have a sense of where the like very heart of the campaigns um, for, the, for this kind of um, restrictions are coming from. Like for example, does it start with an evangelical orientation that then gets blurred into also other conservative positions around environment, et cetera? Or is it something behind that is basically saying, uh, that's using all of these different kinds of restrictions to curtail human rights in general, or American rights in general? In other words, I guess what I'm really asking is how insidious is it? It's pretty insidious. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I mean, and I think we've all, we're all witnessing. I'm sure all, everybody here is paying attention to what's happening in the country right now. Um, I, you know, I think the, what Suhad brought up though, you know, that I think is important for us, I mean, I'm gonna make some assumptions here, which might not be correct, but I think generally speaking, um, people that support uh, the Democratic Party uh, like to think that uh, we are fighting against these types of uh, illiberal policies and these attacks on the ability of rights and human rights. And the reality though is that in this particular case and in many other cases, um, the Democratic Party is as guilty as the Republican Party for where we are here today. And it's gonna be very hard for us necessarily to have an influence on what happens in the Republican Party, particularly as evangelical forces gain more and more power and it becomes more and more wrapped into a sort of theological 
philosophical way of understanding life, because then it's very hard to have a really a debate and a conversation with that. But in the Democratic Party, we have a lot of work to do on this issue, right? The anti-boycott the anti laws that are now targeting other issue areas would not have passed across 33 states if it wasn't for Democratic support. Senator Schumer, to this day, supports anti-BDS bills. I mean, if we can't fix this internally, we cannot start talking about evangelicals yet, right? And so I think that, I think, what is our sphere of influence? Where can we do something? And that's what, how I always think about how to start getting the work done. Thank you. Um, I got a chill down my spine when uh, Hagee from Christians United for Israel introduced his good friend, Bibi Netanyahu, who just won the elections in Israel with 65 seats in the Israeli Knesset. That's the parliament for those who don't know Hebrew. Um, and sure enough, we see his face. Um, did you know, uh, did you anticipate that he was going to win? <laughs> because that was uh, very timely to, to see him there just just uh, that after he won the election. And it, it's very frightening that he's now back uh, in power. Um, and do you anticipate that the pro-Israel lobby is going to intensify its efforts to uh, increase uh, these uh, laws and the, uh, the accompanying censorship that comes with it now that he's back in the saddle? Thank you for that question. Um, you know, I, I think that the thank and and it is incredibly um, there's a new low when Bibi Netanyahu is reelected in Israel. Um, however, I think one of the things and one of in our conversations in the editorial room um, when we were finishing up the film, he had actually just lost um, at that point. The reality is that whether it's Prime Minister Netanyahu or Yair Lapid or Bennett, all of these leaders in Israel have supported these efforts. And in fact, under Bennett and under Lapid's government, um, what you actually saw was an intensification both of the displacement of Palestinian families and communities in across Israel-Palestine. You saw an intensification and a ratcheting up of budgets into the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, now housed under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, concert, which you learn about in the film, was actually refinanced to the tune of 30 million Nice earlier this year and renamed and rebranded to continue their efforts. So the work of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which to put a fine point for those who are not familiar with it, um, its mandate is really to squash the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement and any efforts to delegitimize Israel. What that means is vague, broad, and essentially any critique to the states and to its impact or its policies on Palestinians. And so just keep in mind that um, that's happening under our watch. Uh, the lawfare efforts to silence dissents around Palestine in the US, in the UK, in Germany are all ratcheting up. In addition to these anti-boycott laws, you're now seeing new laws and efforts at the local municipal level where you have similar folks to those who have been advocating for these anti-boycott laws now pushing expanded definitions um, that conflates criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. Um, which is incredibly dangerous. Um, and it actually distracts from the very painful and real anti-Semitism that is being um, perpetuated and hollered from the highest ranks of this country's power. And so um, it's something that we want to be able to organize with all of you who care about what's happening in this country, who care about what's happening in Israel-Palestine, to really start connecting the dots and understanding the through line and the long history um, of where these come from. They don't come out of the blue. They don't come out of a singular leader. They come out of decades and decades of creating a culture that allows for this kind of behavior to stand. We have time for two last questions. I know there's a lot to discuss here. We're gonna take one up at the top. Thank you so much. Um, I come to this film as one among the already convinced, but I look to documentary films for 
films that I can show to those in my circles who are not already convinced. And so I guess my question is um, in terms of showing the rise, you know, the, the Christian evangelical aspect of this and influence, you know, is something that's, you know, I see can give a collective <gasps> to a lot of people who would not otherwise be talking about these issues. I'm wondering about the decision at the end to prominently place a demonstration with a sign that says Zionism is racism. And I'm asking this, I want to say, not to get into a whole discussion of what is Zionism, what is not, but I'm asking in terms of the strategic issues that, that you have already been talking about here. Thank you for this question. Um, so the key for us with telling the story is always to ground it very much in the personal storytelling of the people who have entrusted us with following them over three years to demonstrate what is, in, what, what is motivating them, what is driving them, what is, what is it that they wanna be able to speak that they're not being able to speak about. Um, one of the three main characters in the film is Bahia Maui. We follow her from the beginning of the film, you meet her, you get to know her family, you understand that she's fighting for the ability to be able to keep her job, her livelihood, and be able to advocate for things that are dear and important in her life. The protest that she went to towards the end of the film was during the latest attacks in Gaza, and she was seeing her family, and she was seeing her loved ones, again, at the point of the spear. And in the meantime, she's seeing people who are trying to advocate for Palestinian rights in the United States not being allowed to do so. And that is the demonstration that she went to that we filmed her, and that is her speech. And this is a film about people being able to speak. And so I think that as part of that journey, what we hope is that audiences who might have a hard time, and many will have with that moment, will understand that this is part of the work. If this entire film was just something that you could walk through and you know, be like, oh, this is all good. And there is no discomfort with engaging with the idea that people have different opinions and we need to be able to listen to them and we need to be able to hear. And that Bahia Maui, as a Palestinian American living in this country, should have the ability to participate in a demonstration and we should be able to watch that and still honor what is her freedom of speech and be able to articulate that clearly. So a, a question for our attorney friend. Um, from a tactical perspective, um, it feels like we're much more in a sliding into a Plessy versus Ferguson world rather than a Brown versus the Board of Education world. In more ways than one. Do, do, you, do you suspect that it may be devastatingly wrong uh, moment to bring this topic to the Supreme Court? <laughs> Might this really be an incredibly bad moment? <laughs> I appreciate the question, and, <laughs> and it's obviously something we talked about a lot before we made the decision to file the petition. And I think the first thing that was on our mind is that the Supreme Court will end up hearing this question sooner or later. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And in fact, if the Supreme Court doesn't act, the status quo we have right now is that these laws have already proliferated across 35 states, and now we've got a major federal appeals court stepping in and saying they're okay. Um, and so I think it's important, um, even when I disagree very strongly with many things the Supreme Court does, to at least stand by the rights and the precedents that is already recognized. I mean, Claiborne versus Hardware was a unanimous decision from the Supreme Court 40 years ago, and you even had justices like Justice Scalia calling it one of the court's most important precedents. So although it's sometimes hard um, to keep the faith uh, with the law and the legal profession, especially in days like these, uh, the Supreme Court is there to uphold constitutional rights. And when you're faced with a decision as profoundly wrong as we saw in the Eighth Circuit, when you're faced um, with rights being violated all across the country as they are with all of these laws, we felt that we had to take a stand and ask them to hear the case. Now, they can always decide not to hear the case, right? That might be 
the most likely outcome. I mean, most of the cert petitions that go to the Supreme Court don't get taken up. When they do get taken up, it is overwhelmingly because the Supreme Court disagrees with the underlying decision. And so really what we're saying to the court here is you need to hear this because the Eighth Circuit has erased your precedent and you need to come in and stand up for the law that's already on the books. We're not asking them to invent any new rights to create anything. We're asking them to recognize what they already held. And I think, I still think, that even though I disagree with the Supreme Court on many issues, it is still a robust defender of First Amendment rights and we had to take the chance and ask them to hear this case. Thank you so much, Brian. So we're gonna conclude our Q&A here, but we're gonna invite you all again to join us in the lobby upstairs for a reception hosted by our fellow co-sponsors, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, J. Fred, we can meet the people on this panel and connect with J. Fred, the home for New York progressive Jews fighting to defeat anti-democratic measures like the ones we learned about in our documentary. I'm a proud J. Fred member myself and I really look forward to continuing the conversation. I wanna thank all of you again on our panel for your artistry, for your organizing. Thank you, thank you. And thank you, Marga, for leading this conversation. Um, folks, up in this room next at 7.30, you have The Devil's Drivers. Um, please join us for that. Much more coming up. Uh, the Samaritans tomorrow night, and uh, we are here till Thursday. Please help spread the word. Go out and vote. Thank you so much for coming. Have a good night.